Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final session of our four-part webinar series, Design of Facade Attachments, presented by Alex Zimmer. Today is May 23rd, 2019. My name is Nate Goner with AISC, and I'm your moderator for this presentation. I would like to welcome back our speaker, Alex Zimmer. Alex Zimmer is a senior project manager with Simpson Gumperts and Heger in Waltham, Massachusetts. He joined SGH in 1998, where he designs new building structures with a focus on new academic and healthcare buildings. And he also investigates and rehabilitates existing buildings and other structures. Mr. Zimmer earned his bachelor's degree in engineering from Swarthmore College and his master's degree in structural engineering from Stanford University. He worked with SGH senior principal James Parker to develop AISC's Design Guide 22 on facade attachments to steel framed buildings. And he's presented on this topic a number of times for AISC around the US. Alec, thanks again for being here, and I'll now turn it over to you. Nate, thank you very much for the introduction. Welcome to those who are joining us for the first time and to those who uh, joined me for the previous two sessions. This is the third and final live session, and today we'll be covering a number of topics related to facade attachments, specifically accommodating lateral drifts for both in-plane and out-of-plane movements. And we'll talk about building corners, and we'll conclude with a discussion on uh, designing for uh, less than code loads for performance of the building envelope and setting uh, mean recurrence intervals when we're looking at building envelope performance. So, we're going to start off dealing with drift, and we're going to talk about some of the fundamentals of lateral drift. And by that, I mean specifically displacement between floors of the building, those displacements that are likely to cause damage to the facade or the joints between elements of the facade. Uh, but before we dig into that, I think it's kind of interesting to take a look at the history of facade construction and how we've been doing this for millennia. So for, for thousands of years, we've been constructing buildings using load-bearing masonry walls and piers, and we still do. Um, and then toward the end of the, uh, the 19th century, we started developing some steel frames to support the building load, and we call those transitional masonry buildings. And sort of in the middle of the 20th century, we started developing what I call skinned construction. So let's take a look at bearing wall buildings first. In bearing wall buildings, the facade is the structure, and the structure is the facade. The facade has to support the weight of the floors inside of it, as well as its own weight, and transmit those down to the foundations. And in addition to taking the gravity loads from the building, the facade also is, is quite frequently the lateral load resisting system of the building, if indeed the designers considered lateral loads on the building itself. The Monadnock block, which you see here on the left image, uh, was constructed in two stages, the northern half from 1889 to 19, 1891 and the south half from 1891 to 1893. Now, the north half of the Monadnock uh, was built as the tallest structure in the world, built with load-bearing masonry walls, even, great, even taller than the greatest cathedrals of Europe. And the walls at its base are quite thick, um, about six feet or so at the base. The southern addition to the building, on the other hand, is an early example of steel frame construction, and it relies on the steel frame to distribute its load to the foundations. Uh, a building following up from the Monadnock building is uh, the Reliance building in Chicago. That was in the middle of the last slide I showed you, and that's what we'd call a transitional masonry building. So it has a steel frame that does take the gravity load from the floors and distribute it to the foundations, but it also relies on the mass masonry at the perimeter of the building to control moisture and uh, air infiltration into the building, just like a traditional mass masonry building. And the, the masonry is built tight to the steel frame. So there's no, uh, no explicit consideration of differential movement between the steel frame and the masonry in this case. So the steel frame takes the gravity loads and distributes them to the foundations. And typically, the, uh, the exterior masonry of the building is also its lateral load resisting system, if indeed the original designers explicitly considered the lateral load resistance of the building. Uh, 
And as I said, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, we started developing what I'd call uh, skinned or non-structural exterior wall buildings. And in these buildings, the frame provides all of the gravity and the lateral load resistance, and the facade uh, controls air and moisture infiltration into the building. Uh, that means that when the building undergoes wind and seismic forces, the facade essentially goes along for the ride, displacing with the frame of the building to which it's attached. So again, the frame supports the gravity and lateral loads imposed on the building, and the skin is effectively uh, decoupled from the structure, but moves along for the ride as the, as the building frame sways and deflects. There, there are two primary ways uh, to skin a modern building. Uh, one is, uh, platform framing or slab to slab framing in which the facade spans vertically between the floor plates of the structure. Uh, the other approach is similar to balloon framing which was commonly done in wood frame construction uh, years ago in which the uh, exterior structure of the facade spans past the floor levels uh, and is laterally restrained at the floor levels and is probably gravity supported at some but probably not all of the floor levels. And it's possible to have both facade types in the same building, uh, depending upon the condition. But what's fundamental here is that we provide details that allow relative movement between the frame and the skin. All buildings undergo some structural movement, whether that's from vertical deflections of the floors due to gravity loads, or due to lateral sway or drift of the building due to seismic loads. And we need to think about how those structural movements affect the building facade and the joints in the facade that in some cases we rely on for managing uh, air and moisture infiltration into the building. So why does all of this matter? Well, building designers need to understand and accommodate drifts, and if they don't, the facade uh, may have connections to the building frame that don't allow it, the building frame to displace with respect to the facade. And when that happens, when you don't have connections that allow for this relative displacement between facade and frame to occur, uh, as the building frame tries to deflect laterally, it can impose unintended loads on the facade that it wasn't intended to accommodate. Uh, in the case of this building, which was not in fact a steel frame building, but the concept is similarly applies, the connections of the precast facade panels to the roof structure didn't allow the frame to displace laterally with respect to the, the uh, facade panels. And the connections of the facade panels, which were very stiff, weren't able to uh, withstand the forces imposed upon them, and the facade panels fell from the building. Now, this doesn't really create a, a life safety uh, condition for, in terms of building collapse, but it can create a life safety condition in terms of uh, the people who may be adjacent to the building when these fell off the building. Certainly, there's a risk of human life if this falls on somebody walking by the building or perhaps people who are in the building who have experienced an earthquake who are trying to find a way out. And before we dig into uh, lateral movements on the facade, let's refresh uh, and, and talk about accommodating vertical movement in, in the facade joints. We've talk, touched on this in the previous two sessions, and I think it's worth a refresher here as well. So recall that, that uh, all structures are going to, to be affected by dead and live loads on the building, and those are going to cause the floor framing to deflect. Uh, and that floor framing may or may not support the facade loads. The real concern here is that the vertical structural movements um, need to be kept sufficiently small so that they don't cause horizontal joints in the facade to close and potentially damage sealants or damage the facade components themselves, and that they don't uh, affect the water and air barriers on the building that would affect the, the performance of the facade as, a, as the envelope. So there are a number of other uh, effects that we can have on the facade as well, um, not just the, the live and dead and snow loads and rain loads that are on the structure that can cause um, vertical movement in the facade. Another is thermal and moisture movements. Uh, brick uh, undergoes permanent expansion due to absorption of moisture from the environment throughout its life, so it continues to grow. And all facade materials uh, experience changes in volume due to thermal effects from the environment. So an expression of that, that thermal growth is a function of the, the temperature swing between when the facade is installed on the building and the point we're interested in. 
the length of the facade between horizontal joints and the coefficient of, of linear thermal expansion, alpha. And so for a, a, uh, a brick facade with uh, horizontal joints or maybe even vertical joints spaced at 20 feet on center, it'll expand about an eighth of an inch, which could, re could potentially reduce a, a half inch wide joint to three eighths. And that may or may not be uh, something the joint material can accommodate. So when we look at uh, movement in horizontal joints, we have to consider the fact that it could be compression as the joint t tends to close, or it could be expansion as the joint tends to open. You could have compression if the floor below this uh, uh, moves, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, the floor above this joint moves down, or you could have expansion in the joint if the floor below this joint moves downward. So you have to consider both of these, and where you have fairly large deflections uh, of the floor framing, we tend to use in our practice a silicone sheet as part of the backup waterproofing of the system, and that silicone sheet can compress to effectively zero width or can, can stretch out a great deal to accommodate those vertical movements. Keep in mind that the uh, vertical movement of the facade and the spandrel beam that supports the facade isn't necessarily uniform along the length of the spandrel. Obviously, at mid-span, you'll get more vertical deflection than you will near a column. Uh, and that movement can be opening of a joint, as we saw in the last slide, or it could be closing of the joint, as we saw in the last slide, depending upon where in the facade you are and which floors are loaded and which are not. Keep in mind also that as a floor supporting a facade like this deflects downward. If the facade is panelized, as you see here, you end up with closing of the joint at the top and opening of the joint at the bottom. So you get movement in the vertical joints due to vertical movement of the, of the spandrel beam that supports the facade. Also look out for, for transitions in the facade support. Uh, this is a photograph of a, a building that my company investigated some time ago. I wasn't involved in the project, but we provided some facade consulting services. And it's a case study in the fact that we need to be careful uh, where there are transitions between how the facade is supported. So we're going to focus on this area circled here in red and zoom in on that in the next slide. At this location, there's a low parapet uh, with a low roof uh, behind it and to the right of this parapet, the facade continues up for several more stories. So let's look at this in context of where the floors and roof structures are behind the facade in the next slide. So here again is that parapet condition and here's the wall continuing past the parapet in yellow. The gravity load for everything in blue is supported here at this lower floor level, including the parapet. Uh, here where the wall rises up uh, beyond the parapet, shown in yellow, is supported on the upper floor level. So you get differential movement between the two spandrel beams at this location here, uh, between the two. So this facade will tend to move downward with this floor, this facade will tend to move with this floor. And so when we repaired this uh, condition, we introduced a joint in the facade, in the, in the uh, backup waterproofing, which you see here, to accommodate that differential movement. And here is a view of the opposite hand of that condition after the repair had been installed with a joint uh, in the backup system, as you see here. <clears throat> so now let's move on to accommodating lateral drift of the building frame uh, in the facade design. The most common sources of horizontal movement in the building are due to wind loads and seismic loads, although you can have drift of a building due to gravity loads as well, particularly in a cantilevered structure, so that's certainly something to pay attention to. Today we'll focus primarily on wind and seismic loads. And note that we're not so much concerned about the total building drift, in other words, how much the building sways at its top relative to its foundation, uh, although the building code is certainly concerned about that and trying to prevent pounding of adjacent buildings, particularly in a seismic event. What we're concerned about today when we're detailing the facade is the interstory drift, that is to say, how much one floor displaces relative to its upper and lower neighbors. So it's this interstory drift that we need to be concerned about when we detail the facade connections and we look at the effects of these drifts on the joints. Now be aware that 
the facade movement isn't just parallel to the plane of the facade, which we're showing here in blue. So the facade can move parallel uh, to its plane, but you also have forces that are acting perpendicular to the plane of the facade as well, and these need to be accounted for in the design. So let's start out talking about out-of-plane movement uh, due to interstory drift of the structure. There are essentially three methods for accommodating building lateral displacement perpendicular to the plane of the frame. One is rigid body translation on the left. In the middle, there's rigid body rotation of the facade, and to the right, there's distortion and curvature of the facade. And these all accommodate uh, interstory deflection delta from one floor to the floor above. So in terms of rigid body translation, a designer might consider this approach if there are fairly rigid facade elements and there's the ability to allow some hinging in the facade itself to occur. Now, this example is shown uh, schematically as precast panels with um, a strip window that runs uh, between the lower and upper portions of that precast panel. But the, the important thing to re remember here is that th this window has to be continuous in order for this kind of uh, accommodation of lateral drift to, to be handled effectively. And the connections of the window head and sill need to be able to accommodate this rotation over the height of the window. A more common way of addressing this, where you have a relatively rigid facade system, is by allowing rotation at the facade system's connections to the base building structure. So the upper floor displaces with respect to the lower one, and rotation occurs at the connections. A third method for doing this is allowing the facade to flex or distort between them and having rigid connections or, or connections that restrain rotation to the base building structure. In our experience, this option is, is rarely done, at least not intentionally, uh, because doing this can affect the response of the building, particularly due to seismic loads, and depending upon the flexibility of the facade system, it can cause damage to the facade system. So you wouldn't want to do this to a facade system that is particularly brittle, for example, uh, EFS or maybe brick veneer. You might be able to do it with a relatively flexible metal panel. Um, but in general, we find that the middle approach, the rigid body rotation, is probably the most effective for most different facade systems. Now, when it comes to addressing in-plane drift, in other words, parallel to the plane of the facade, there, the, the same three mechanisms are possible. There's rigid body translation of the facade, rigid body rotation, and distortion or racking of the facade panels. In rigid body translation, the panels displace with the floors that support their gravity loads, and they have the connections that can accommodate this translation with respect to other floors. So in, in the lowest story of panel, the panel uh, stays with the lower floor where the gravity load is supported here, and the upper floor displaces with respect to the lower floor, and you get slip or sliding in the joint between the two panels. And the same thing repeats throughout the height of the building. So you get story drift from here to here, and you get a story drift from here to here. In terms of rigid body rotation, in that case, and this, is, this may be difficult to accommodate uh, for some facade types, uh, the connections have to be able to accommodate rotation of the panel at both the top and the bottom. This may be difficult to accommodate on panels with a wide to relatively squat aspect ratio. And we'll talk more about this in a few slides. The third option is distortion or racking, in which the panels effectively become parallelogram shaped. Um, the, the, the top and, and bottom displace with the floors that they are rigidly connected to, and the panels uh, develop racking or a shape like this that accommodates the differential movement between adjacent floors. Uh, this is sometimes done in uh, aluminum glass curtain wall, for example, and we'll talk more about that in a few slides. Um, so uh, as a short example about of racking, uh, let's look at a metal stud backup system. Sometimes, uh, more inadvertently perhaps than intentionally, uh, metal stud framing is attached to a track, which may be then and the, the attachment of the metal studs to the track at the top uh, inhibits 
uh, displacement of the studs relative to the track, and if the track is attached to the structure above, then the uh, studs are forced to rack and displace, as you see here in the image on the right. Effectively, the sheathing that's on the metal studs, such as gypsum wallboard, uh, has it effectively acting as a, a mini shear wall. Maybe not intentionally so, but it has to resist some in-plane shear as the top of the stud wall racks or displaces relative to the floor below it. So if we have a 12-foot floor-to-floor height and we have to undergo an inch and a half of lateral displacement relative to the uh, up lower and upper floors, in a one-foot height between fasteners that connect the gypsum wallboard to the metal stud framing, we have a displacement of an eighth of an inch from one fastener relative to the fastener one foot above it. Um, and so that displacement uh, is probably not a life safety problem, but it may damage the, uh, the screws that attach the gypsum wallboard to the stud framing. Uh, it may damage the gypsum wallboard, and it may also uh, cause damage to the air and water barrier that is probably applied over top of the gypsum wallboard. And that's something you're not likely to see unless you take the veneer off the building. So generally, when it comes to metal stud backup, uh, we recommend using the rigid body translation approach um, because, as I said, the sheathing effectively acts like a shear wall. So this is a relatively stiff panel for in-plane loads. It's not likely to undergo um, uh, shearing deformation except at the joint between the top of the panel and the floor above it, and similarly up here at the top of this panel and the floor above it. So in this diagram, and you'll see similar diagrams like this throughout the presentation today, we're using arrows to indicate the direction of in-plane load resistance and Xs to indicate the direction of out-of-plane load resistance. So in the case of this panel, uh, we're restraining uh, both horizontal in-plane force and vertical in-plane force, in other words, gravity forces, here at the bottom of the panel, but we have only a lateral connection at the top of the panel. We allow the panel to slide relative to the floor above it, and uh, we're not uh, uh, imposing any vertical force from the floor above the panel into the panel. We're only restraining out-of-plane motion. So that when the floors do displace, you end up with uh, sliding of the upper floor relative to the lower panel. And there's no distortion in the metal studs and less likely to damage the gypsum wallboard and the air and water barriers that are applied over that sheathing. When it comes to other facade systems, uh, like uh, precast panels, as you see here, uh, we similarly have to account for uh, uh, drift. And again, we typically tend to do that using rigid body translation, allowing one panel to displace with the floor that it's gravity connected to and slipping between adjacent panels. One important thing to point out here is that, uh, particularly in a precast panel system, which is likely to undergo shrinkage, uh, over its life, uh, we only restrain in-plane motion at one of the two anchors. So here we're restraining uh, in-plane horizontal motion and vertical motion, but at this right-hand connection, we're only restraining vertical motion and not restraining in-plane motion. And of course, to all of them, we restrain out-of-plane motion. Another example of how you might address this with precast panels um, with an L-shaped panel. Now. Sometimes it's necessary to have rigid body rotation mixed in with translation. And you might have this condition, again, in a precast panel situation where you have spandrel panels and you have column covers as well. So in this case, the, the panels that cover the floor levels displace with the floors as you might expect them to in rigid body translation. But the column covers have to undergo rigid body rotation. Uh, to accommodate the interstory drift. They displace with the columns to which they're attached. Notice that as you do this, some joints open on one side and close on the other side. And we have to provide joints that are sufficiently wide to let this occur. And in the example of a precast clad building, quite often the air and water barriers of the building rely on the sealants in these joints for uh, uh, air and, and uh, moisture performance. So it's important that these joints not be damaged uh, during uh, 
uh, wind or, or seismic events. So we want to make sure that we're not damaging the joints as these uh, panels undergo rigid body rotation. Another thing to notice here is that we only have one gravity support for these panels here at the bottom. We're providing some lateral restraint here at the top, but this restrains gravity and lateral here at the bottom. And that means you don't have very much redundancy on these connections. And so when you're designing the connections of the precast to the uh, building structure, to its connection to the column, uh, it's important that these connections have a lot of durability because they're going to be concealed for the life of the building, and you probably won't know if you have a problem until it's too late in terms of durability. We also want to make sure that they're sufficiently ductile. They're not likely to, to fracture brilliantly in a uh, lateral event, and uh, make sure they have adequate strength as well. Uh, another note about uh, types of deformations that a building is likely to undergo. Uh, interstory uh, deformations between floors are really a combination of frame shear deformations, which you see here on the left, the effectively racking of the building frame, and flexural deformations of the building frame. In other words, uh, behaving like a cantilever uh, as the building cantilevers from its foundations. Uh, Larry Griffiths of Walter P. Moore published a paper about the effects of frame distortion on facade panels. And in it, he points out that shear deformations of the building frame affect the joints in the facade much more than the flexural deformations do. In other words, you end up with uh, compression and uh, op opening of joints due to racking of uh, facade panels as well as shearing along the joints due to shear deformation of the building frame. But in terms of flexural deformation of the building frame, there's not much deformation of the joints themselves as the building undergoes flexural deformation. So flexural deformations are generally not a problem for relatively short buildings, say less than 10 stories. In a relatively short to mid-rise building, we, we typically presume that all interstory drift is shear deformation. In reality, some is flexural, but it's predominantly shear behavior, as you see here. In taller buildings that undergo uh, a lot of flexural deformation, say a high-rise building, you end up with uh, flexural deformation contributing more to the overall deformation of the building. Let's go back and look for a minute at rigid body rotation connections. Um, as I mentioned before, the connections in this type of uh, panel connection need to be able to accommodate rotation of the panel about those connections. So as this, as this uh, building undergoes interstory drift to the right, the panel rotates as a rigid body, rotating about the gravity connection that you see down here at the bottom, as well as rotating about the lateral connection for in-plane loads at the top. And again, we are having uh, out-of-plane lateral connections at all four corners as well as at the center of the panel. So these connections have to be relatively flexible to permit this out-of-plane, sorry, this in-plane movement to occur, and they have to be accommodating of rotation at, at the gravity and lateral in-plane connections as well. And as I mentioned, this may be fairly difficult to accommodate on a panel with a wide to fairly short aspect ratio. You might see this kind of uh, facade attachment in a fairly narrow but tall uh, facade system like precast column covers or perhaps uh, relatively narrow metal panels that are oriented in the vertical direction. Again, for in-plane movements, we most predominantly see uh, rigid body translation as the way to accommodate in-plane movements. So in other words, uh, the floor moving horizontally relative to a relatively rigid panel below that horizontal joint in the facade that you see here. One thing to watch out for, and I mentioned this a few sessions ago, is the position of the backup wall with respect to columns. So these are both plan views looking down at a, a column that it's going to have to undergo some lateral translation as the building sways due to wind or seismic forces. And the position of that backup wall that you see above the column in this horizontal, this plan section, needs to be carefully considered. Do you let the backup wall run completely by the column? Or if you have a relatively narrow slab edge, perhaps you have to reduce the depth of the backup locally at the column uh, so that when the column undergoes lateral sway, 
it doesn't get hung up on the backup structure. This is shown schematically as CMU, but it could just as easily be metal stud. And we want to make sure that the column's lateral sway is not impinged upon by the backup wall. And in the next slide, you'll see a condition of what happens when we build the masonry tight to the building frame. Now, I doubt in this case that it was explicitly considered as a shear wall. I think it's just uh, uh, inappropriate detailing of the backup wall getting built tight to this column, such that when this column tries to undergo sway parallel to the plane of the wall, it gets hung up on the backup wall, and the backup wall effectively behaves as a shear wall, and it probably wasn't designed to, to behave that way. Let's look at top of wall connections for a few minutes. Um, the architect will likely perform and specify what the backup wall system is and uh, how it's connected to the base building structure, whether it runs by the spandrel beam and dies into the underside of the slab edge, or whether perhaps it stops the underside of the spandrel beam and you just short piece of infill back up between the bottom flange of the spandrel beam and the slab above. But as I said, typically this is something the architect is going to specify and the structural engineer of record needs to pay careful attention to and perhaps collaborate with the architect on how to do this. I've found in my experience that running the facades, the backup wall by the spandrel beam is most effective. Uh, it's less work for the contractors who are installing it. But in either case, the connection uh, at the top of the wall needs to be able to accommodate uh, in-plane displacements relative to the slab and the spandrel beam. In other words, we don't want to impose uh, horizontal shears from the floor diaphragm into the backup wall. And uh, we also want to make sure that we're not uh, creating a vertical load on the backup wall as the spandrel beam and slab try to deflect under gravity loads. So we want to make sure that we're accommodating in-plane motion of the wall, uh, both parallel to the wall in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. We also want to make sure the backup wall is restrained laterally so it doesn't fall away from the building. And, um, so you can see that here where the wall runs to the underside of the slab, and similarly where the wall runs to the underside of the spandrel beam, we provide some clips that allow the spandrel beam to deflect with respect to the top of the wall for vertical loads. We allow the uh, spandrel beam to move parallel to the wall so in other words, there are no through bolts or anchors here, uh, but we do capture the top of the wall for out of plane movement. Now, both of these show CMU, but it's also typically done for metal stud backup. This is a photograph from one of my projects where we had a metal stud backup wall, and you can barely make it out here, but there's a plate uh, that is supported from these hanger angles that support the brick shelf angle. We've got a plate back here that, that catches the top of the slip track for the stud wall below, and eventually we'll have some stud infill between this plate and the underside of the slab above. When you have multiple different types of facades on a building that are adjacent to one another, for example, whether you have curtain wall uh, that is immediately adjacent to a fairly rigid facade system such as metal panel, or perhaps it's brick veneer, we need to think about how they displace relative to one another. So in this case of curtain wall, it's not uncommon for curtain walls to rack to, uh, to accommodate lateral drift, whereas a relatively rigid facade system is likely to behave as a rigid body translation. So the joints need to be able to accommodate that, that movement. So when the upper floor displaces, some amount delta, you get the joint between them opening at the top, but perhaps you get the joint at the bottom closing. And you need to make sure that you've provided a joint that's wide enough to accommodate this movement without damaging the facade components, for example, fracturing glass or damaging the metal panel. And we also don't want to damage the air and water barriers that are probably integrated into this joint. So it may be necessary to have a wider joint to accommodate this differential movement. Uh, and you need to design this joint for the ultimate inelastic seismic drift of the building. And that may be quite large. So it's important to have a discussion with the architect up front who might be responsible for specifying this joint material 
uh, and making sure the architect is aware how the facade systems are likely to displace relative to one another and making sure that you're providing a joint between the two that is wide enough to accommodate the, their different uh, displacement styles, if you will. So all until now we've been talking about uh, displacements uh, looking at just a planar condition, a 2D condition. Uh, corners get complicated and interesting because we have movements in both directions of the, at the corner. We have directions, uh, in this case, left to right, as well as uh, sort of on the diagonal here in, in, in this image. And some of these displacements can occur simultaneously, as you might have in an earthquake or a wind event. So it's important to study this. And the, the corner is a very complicated condition. Uh, in some cases, you'll have joints compressing, as you see here, as, as one panel moves relative to another, or it's possible you could have out-of-plane motion, as you see here, with one panel trying to move by its neighbor. So the joints have to be able to accommodate this kind of motion. So here's a plan view of a corner a condition. There's a column that you see here, and it has some lateral tiebacks to some precast panels here and here. These are not gravity connections, these are just lateral tieback connections. Now, if the, if the building itself undergoes drift to the left and the column displaces with that lateral drift, it pulls the top of this panel, which you see on the right, with it. So that panel undergoes essentially rotation uh, perpendicular to its plane or translation perpendicular to its plane. And the panel that is running left to right on the page essentially stays put. Um, it displaces with the floor below it, but not probably as much as this panel on the right wants to move. So you get shearing in this joint, and you get some rotation of the tieback anchors. So what that means is that tieback anchors that are primarily intended to restrain out-of-plane motion need to be able to be flexible enough not to hinder the movement of the column. They have to be relatively flexible uh, perpendicular to the, their axis. And for that reason, these are quite often rods or, or relatively light sections that are capable of undergoing some flexure without being permanently deformed. And of course, it's possible to have deformation in the north-south direction as well. In that case, uh, we're showing here the column is moving downward or south on the page, and the panel uh, that you see here is not moving very much panel that's running left to right on the page is trying to displace with the column because it's getting dragged along with that tieback connection. So you get, again, flexure in this tieback connection. And you may risk damaging or breaking off the corner of the panel because it's effectively restrained by its uh, neighbor around the corner. So those are things to be aware of. So how might you address this kind of condition? One way to do it is by having a relatively short return on both the backup wall and the exterior cladding. So the gray is the backup wall, the, uh, the beige color is the cladding, or the veneer. And having a fairly wide joint in that corner that can accommodate uh, compression uh, that would close the joint or expansion. Um, but that joint also has to be able to accommodate shearing perpendicular to it. Uh, as you see here, and it may need to be able to accommodate both simultaneously, so compression or extension and shearing of the joint. So as a quick example of this, let's look at a project some of my colleagues on the West Coast looked at. This is a building in San Francisco in a high seismic region. Uh, the building has a lot going on in it. It has brick veneer, it has some metal panel cladding, it has some curtain walls you see here, it has some parapet conditions, and it has joints between the two, and it obviously has a lot of corners. So there's a lot to deal with here, and given where it's located, uh, drift is a real issue that we need to accommodate in the design. Uh, as a quick case study, let's look at the corner, which you see here. So the brick veneer wraps this corner. Let's look at how we might have addressed this condition. Um, this photo that I'm showing you here is not, in fact, from the project that I just showed you, but the concept is similar. I didn't have any... Uh, photos of the actual building, but the concept is the same. It's a very wide joint uh, with some bellows in it that can accommodate movement in both the direction parallel to the wall here, can accommodate uh, movement perpendicular to the plane of the wall as well uh, in both directions. 
So that's how you might accommodate it in a brick veneer. Um, and it's certainly not a particularly uh, aesthetically appealing joint in that it doesn't mimic the brick exactly, but you can get colors that match the brick and the other materials pretty closely. And so it's, I don't think, in my opinion, aesthetically uh, unappealing. Uh, in the case of a, a joint at a corner, for example, a metal panel, where you're going to have large displacements of one wall with respect to the other that may close the joint or may cause shearing perpendicular to the plane of the joint, uh, we often use in our backup waterproofing system, our primary waterproofing system, we use um, a silicone sheet with a bellows in it, as you see here. This silicone sheet can be compressed to almost zero width. It can stretch out uh, considerably in, in the left to right direction, and it can accommodate shearing perpendicular to the uh, uh, plane of the joint. And it's important this be a fairly durable connection, uh, which because it's going to be concealed for the life of the building. You probably won't realize you have a problem with it uh, until the building comes down or you have leakage. Now, how do you cover a joint like this? Well, one way to do it might be to provide what I'd call a crumple zone. In other words, a break metal panel cover that is flexible and can permanently deform in a wind or seismic event. So this metal panel is designed to displace and permanently deform as the building undergoes lateral translation, as you see here. So if the facade moves left to right or up and down, as you see in this plan section, the metal panel simply crumples. And it can be replaced relatively easily and inexpensively. And we haven't compromised the backup waterproofing that is in the plane back here. So we've talked about joints, how we actually accommodate movement, and uh, how we might detail some of those joints. Let's talk about the forces that cause the joints to move in the first place. So we'll talk about wind first. And we need to consider the wind forces on the main lateral force resisting system of the building to determine how strong the building has to be. We want to make sure the building doesn't have a problem uh, due to lateral wind forces on it and provide sufficient uh, strength uh, and stability for the structure. But when we design the components and cladding of the building itself using ASCE 716 loads, uh, we need to use a different set of wind forces for the facade panels themselves and their attachments to the base building structure. And when we look at these loads, we find that typically the lateral force resisting system loads are of a higher magnitude than the components and cladding loads, and that's because uh, effectively, you will have uh, uh, locally um, larger magnitudes of loads at some spots in the facade than others. But when that's averaged out over the entire facade, uh, you end up with a, a lower force on average. And that's what you design the lateral force resisting system of the building for. And you need to make sure the building facade has adequate strength to resist those forces and the connections of the building to be able to accommodate the drift of the lateral force resisting system. Components and cladding, on the other hand, get designed for locally higher forces. And those attachments to the building structure also get designed for those, those uh, higher forces. Now, when you're looking at the drift of the building itself, that's not codified in ASE 716. There's no drift limit uh, for a building in ASE 7. So the, one consideration we have when we design for drift is that we want to make sure that we're not um, uh, necessarily designing for the strength level forces. We might design for service level forces. And at those reduced service level forces, we want to make sure we're not creating problems with our air and water barriers in the building. So again, we're concerned primarily about interstory drift. Uh, typically, in our practice, we limit this to the story height over 400 or 450, uh, depending upon the building. Uh, and be aware, however, that the actual interstory drift may be limited by what the facade system and its joints are able to accommodate. So let's look for a few minutes at the mean recurrence interval for different building risk categories. On the low end of the spectrum, we have buildings that are relatively low risk to human life. 
uh, and loss of property. Uh, those are designed with a mean recurrence interval of about 300 years. For uh, more critical structures in the categories 3 and 4, they're designed for a mean recurrence interval of 1,700 years, and therefore a larger wind speed, and obviously higher wind pressures that go with it. So we need to think also about the serviceability of the building and its performance due to uh, for, for its impact on the water and air barriers of the building. Now this is not codified in ASC 716. You won't find it in the code portion of ASC 716. But uh, the commentary to ASC 716 uh, includes this load combination for evaluating wind drift on buildings. And this is the drift that you might consider when you evaluate the, the lateral drift of the building on the building's facade and its joints. So it's dead load plus half of live load plus WA, where WA varies depending upon the mean recurrence interval. And it does this through having uh, different wind speed maps for different mean recurrence intervals. So if you're designing for a 100-year mean recurrence interval, that's an event that has a 1% annual probability of exceedance, you would be designing, in this case, for a Boston, Massachusetts building in risk category two, you'd be designing for 69% of the strength level wind force. So you get a 30% reduction in your wind forces. If you're designing for a 50-year mean recurrence interval, you're designing for 58% of the ultimate strength-based wind forces, 25-year mean recurrence interval, 50%, and so on. So you get a fairly significant reduction in the forces you have to design for, and therefore you get a reduced drift that you design the joints of the facade for. A quick commentary on IBC 2015 table 1604. There are some prescribed uh, wind deflections, and these are specifically for out-of-plane wind deflection for a variety of exterior wall finishes, whether they're brittle finishes like plaster or stucco, or whether they're relatively flexible finishes like metal panel that might be able to accommodate a fairly large interstory drift, or out of plane deflection, excuse me. But these are for deflection of the facade system uh, out of plane relative to its supports at the top and bottom. Now, a footnote to this table, footnote F, says that wind loads are permitted to be taken as 0.42 times the components and cladding loads for the purposes of turning deflection limits herein. So that's 0.42 times the strength or ultimate wind forces that you get from the, the body of ASC 716. It is not uh, using the values WA that we talked about here in the previous slide. So it's not 60% of this value. It's uh, sorry, it's not 42% of this value, it's 42% uh, of the full strength value. Now, the, for, the point 42 includes uh, two things. It includes point 0.7, which is a reduction from the strength to service level, and it includes a reduction of point 0.6 as well, which is to reduce from uh, a say 750 year mean recurrence interval to a shorter mean recurrence interval, say 100 years, which might be appropriate for serviceability considerations. So the 0.42 represents 0.7 times 0.6. Uh, and those again are on the ultimate strength loads uh, for components and cladding. Footnote uh, F goes on to indicate that for uh, elements that support glazing, you are only permitted to reduce the strength forces by 60%. And I believe this is to uh, try to limit the risk of, of glass breakage due to out-of-plane loads. Though the commentary doesn't really clarify that. Let's move on to seismic loads. Again, we design the seismic loads for the, uh, sorry, we designed the lateral force resisting system for strength level loads. And we also have to design architectural components uh, to determine the facade attachment forces. And those are two separate sets of equations. I won't go through the lateral force resisting system loads today, but uh, we'll, we'll get into the facade loads today. So for out-of-plane forces and in-plane forces, both lateral and vertical, Chapter 13 of ASC 716 uh, provides facade element strengths as well as facade attachment strengths. And those are two different values. So you design the body of a panel 
uh, for a different load than you design its connections back to the base building structure. The, the strength level drifts that we calculate for the lateral force resisting system of the building uh, are in Chapter 12 of ASC 716. And those provide the loads for which you design the base building structure itself. Uh, and from those, you might derive what the uh, ultimate inelastic drift of the building is likely to be. And it is important the facade elements uh, not fail or fall from the building in a, in a design level earthquake. So the connections of the facade system have to be able to accommodate the drift. Then we can get down to what the service level drift is. And this isn't really codified. Um, we might design the facade joints, in other words, the, the waterproofing and the air barriers of the building, might be designed for a lower level of uh, ground shaking than we design the building frame for. So in other words, we might uh, be able to accommodate some level of, of seismic movement and expect that the air and water barriers on the building not fail for a, a uh, lower magnitude event. So let's talk about that. The first thing to get into is the facade attachment loads themselves. These are again are from chapter 13 of ASC 716. Um, and I should note here that buildings in seismic design category A are exempt from this, as are some elements in seismic design category B. So depending on where your building is located and its uh, risk category, you may not have to uh, use this uh, depending upon your building. But for buildings that are in high design categories, you certainly will have to pay attention to this. So backing up just one second, uh, some important things to note here are SDS is the, uh, is the uh, coefficient of uh, shaking, WP is the weight of the facade panel itself, Z is its height above grade. So if you're looking at something on the parapet level where Z is equal to H, this term uh, reduces to 3. So you get much higher forces at the top of the building than at the bottom. R is, is akin to the uh, uh, ductility factor, as you would for the base building structure. And IP is a component importance factor. So we have to design our facade connections to accommodate um, relative displacements uh, relative to the, uh, the building frame itself. So when we design the facade elements like curtain walls or like gauge metal framing, uh, that is delegated to a specialty structural engineer, the structural engineer of record needs to communicate interstory lateral drifts to the specialty structural engineer who's responsible for the design of the facade attachments themselves. So the facade attachments need to be able to accommodate this drift DPL, uh, which is uh, related to the <clears throat> Uh, maximum inelastic drift that the building frame is likely to undergo. And again, this is an interstory drift between uh, adjacent floor levels. So in our experience, uh, the information on this drift is not often communicated through the is often communicated through architect specifications. So the architect might put together a performance specification for aluminum glass curtain wall, and that specification might include uh, the value of uh, inelastic drift that the facade system needs to accommodate without failure. Might also include the amount of seismic drift that that uh, facade system needs to accommodate without damage to the air and water barriers of the building. So it's not usually the structural engineer's role to take on the design of the curtain wall or the metal panel cladding or, or take responsibility for it, but the structural engineer record is the, the best uh, designer equipped to provide this information to the specialty structural engineer. We also need to pay consideration to uh, exterior non-structural wall elements and their connections, and those need to be also need to be designed to accommodate relative seismic displacements relative to the building frame in combination with temperature change uh, and due to building structural movements. And the connections of the panel joints need to be able to accommodate the story drifts caused by relative seismic displacements uh, determined from analysis or half an inch, whichever is greater. And those connections uh, need to be able to uh, accommodate uh, uh, those movements with some ductility. Uh, 
So in other words, if you have a connection that accommodates the drift through sliding or bending of steel rods, you need to make sure those rods have sufficient strength and ductility that they can undergo the appropriate amount of lateral uh, displacement. And this is particularly true on precast panels, which have, uh, are fairly massive and may have fairly large seismic forces associated with them. And again, there's some language here providing uh, information on the diameter to length of rods so that they are appropriately uh, flexible, uh, parallel to the plane of the facade panels. And again, that continues here in the next slide. I, I won't take the time to go through those today. Now, when it comes to designing the attachment of the panel itself to the, uh, to the base building structure, uh, we're designing for a variety of different connection types. For example, we're for designing a wall panel itself, so the, uh, the, uh, the, we're the body of the, of the wall panel. We might be designing for an RP of two and a half and an AP of one. Uh, for designing the fasteners of those uh, panels to the base building structure, we might be designing for an RP of one and an AP of one and a half. That means that you're designing the, the fastener that holds the panel itself to the base building structure for a force, a seismic force three times greater than you designed the body of the panel for. And the, the intention here is that you're going to have relatively few of these connectors uh, to the base building structure so that you have static determinacy of the loads into the base building structure. And because you have relatively few of those connections, uh, you need to have a greater reliability of that connection so that it doesn't fail and fall off the building. When you're looking at glazing, uh, you need to consider the fact that the, uh, fall, the fallout deformation of the uh, glazing system has to be greater than one, one and a quarter times the anticipated uh, inelastic displacement of the building frame. The idea here is you want to make sure that the, build, that the, the glazing is able to stay in the frame uh, following an earthquake. And this is determined using the AMA test 501.6. So we want to make sure there's sufficient glass to frame clearance to accommodate displacement, but that it doesn't fall out of the frame. There are exceptions to this, uh, this provision, as you see here. And a quick graphic showing you how this is expressed is that you make sure you have clearances between the glazing and the frame so that you, it can accommodate some racking of the frame but that the glass doesn't fall out of the frame. So you see you have clearances on the sides, on the top and on the bottom, and on the bottom you have some setting blocks that take the gravity load of the glazing itself. So let's quickly compare wind forces and their mean recurrence interval to seismic. So for wind, uh, we looked at this earlier, uh, we have relatively short mean recurrence interval for risk category one buildings of 300 years, for higher risk category buildings, it might be 1,700 years. And for comparison, seismic forces are based on uh, a 1,200 to 1,300 year mean recurrence interval in lower to moderate seismic regions, such as we have in the East Coast and the Midwest. Uh, and in the West Coast, they're typically 375 to 800 year mean recurrence intervals in the higher seismic regions. So the building code, uh, ASC 716, does provide us some maximum allowable story drifts here in Table 12.12-1. Uh, and you can see that it allows larger drifts for lower risk category buildings and smaller drifts for uh, higher risk category buildings. And uh, also note that we're going to have relatively high seismic drifts reflect our expectation in comparison to wind anyway, that uh, high seismic, uh, that, that the seismic system will under, uh, deform substantially under a design earthquake event. So we're assuming that the building is going to undergo inelastic movement in a seismic event, whereas the building will probably stay elastic during a wind event.
Now, it may uh, requiring tighter seismic drifts than these will limit damage during an earthquake, but it would require a heavier, more expensive building frame. So there's a, a trade-off in the cost of the building frame versus uh, risk of potential damage to the facade. So how much drift should we allow uh, for the building such that we try to minimize damage to the facade? And at what level of ground shaking uh, should, we, should we do this? So you can think of the amount of damage that a building undergoes on kind of a spectrum from fully operational immediately following event to being maybe, maybe immediately occupied but not necessarily operational to being life safe. The structure hasn't collapsed uh, but has undergone substantial damage or maybe it is uh, just barely hanging on and uh, has not just barely avoided collapse and is a complete loss. So in terms of how this looks in terms of the drift of the building, uh, in terms of operational behavior, the building has probably stayed elastic. Immediate occupancy, it's starting to have some inelastic deformation. Under the code prescribed life safety loads, we are definitely in inelastic behavior of the building with fairly significant damage. And here we're just on the verge of collapse and uh, probably going to be a complete knockdown of the building. So what does that look in terms of the drift? Well, this again is from ASC 716 and shows you uh, the amount of drift you can expect relative one, floor, uh, one story relative to another. And these are the drifts that you would use to compute the uh, maximum drifts that I described to you for the facade connections a few slides ago. So when we compute the inelastic drifts, that's delta x, that's equal to CD, which is a deflection amplification factor, which is based on the building's lateral load resisting system type and, and how much inelastic behavior you expect. It's the times the the elastic deformations, delta XE, that you might get from your analysis software, divided by the importance factor of the building. So what that looks like in terms of the code design story drift is that uh, we are designing for the elastic drift and we're multiplying it by this factor CD over I to estimate what the maximum inelastic drift is. And again, that's based on the lateral load resisting system type. So in terms of the anticipated performance of the building, uh, so the, the lowest goal of the uh, building code is that we have collapse prevention. And that we do that when we consider the maximum considered earthquake. This is the most severe earthquake that's considered by ASCE 716. And the return period of this is typically on the order of greater than 1,000 years, as I showed you earlier, particularly on the east coast of the, uh, the US, a lower uh, mean recurrence interval on the west coast. But buildings in, uh, for this must have uh, exceptionally low probability of collapse. So this is sort of implied by the code. What the code actually prescribes is the uh, two-thirds of the maximum considered ground motion intensity. So this, this reduces the mean recurrence interval for strength. And the, and the anticipation is the building will have some margin of safety against collapse, some reserve strength. Um, and the platting components do not fall from the building after this design level earthquake. But it's also possible to design for a service level earthquake with the goal of property protection. In other words, we, we try to minimize the amount of damage to the structure that occurs for a lower intensity event with probably a shorter mean recurrence interval. Now this is not codified in ASE 716. This is a serviceability condition and it's something that structural designers and facade designers should discuss with building owners and architects when they're setting up the performance objectives for the building. So let's take a quick look at some anticipated amounts of damage for percent lateral drift for two different types. You can have a stucco wall system on the left and an aluminum glass curtain wall on the right, stick built, and you'll see that for relatively small drifts in the relatively fragile and brittle stucco, stucco wall system, uh, you get fairly substantial damage. So at roughly 1% drift, you get moderate to extensive damage, uh, whereas a glass curtain wall system can probably undergo slight 
uh, one two percent drift with only slight damage to it. So in other words, we have gasket failures, uh, but we're not having the glass falling out of the glazing system. So thinking about what type of building you have, what type of cladding you have, and what the owner's tolerance is for needing to do repairs following an event will determine what kind of drift you can you think you can reasonably accommodate, and therefore uh, what level of of uh, ground shaking you should probably design your building for. Again, for performance objective, this is not for the strength of the building frame itself. And I should add that those, uh, those came from FEMA P58. Now, in the past, some designers have opted to set the interstory drift for the envelope performance, in other words, having uh, relatively uh, little damage to the facade uh, and maintaining the air and water barriers of the building on the, quote, elastic drift. In other words, this is based on the drift you might extract from your lateral analysis model without scaling it by CD over I to account for inelastic behavior. So this is the elastic drift straight from your analysis. In practice, this approach is probably not a very good choice because it's not risk-informed. It doesn't take into consideration what the owner is going to accommodate in terms of repair costs and frequency of making those repairs. You can have two otherwise identical buildings, uh, but with different lateral load resisting systems at the same location and have uh, similar uh, ultimate inelastic drifts but you, uh, you can have effectively designed the facade attachment for elastic drift based on the analysis model. You might be designing for too little drift in buildings with uh, large R values. So a quick look at um, mean recurrence interval and probability of exceedance. This is an important aspect uh, to discuss with the building owner when trying to gauge what level of drift might be appropriate uh, for having a uh, facade that continues to perform after an earthquake. Um, in case if you're looking at a 500-year mean recurrence interval, you have to anticipate that there's a 18% probability of that occurring in a 100-year span. On the other hand, if you're designing something for a 100-year mean recurrence interval, within a 50-year time frame, there's a 39% chance of that occurring. If you design for a 50-year mean recurrence interval, uh, within 50 years, there's a 63% chance of that occurring. So if you're designing for a, a building client who's likely to hold the building for a long time and doesn't have uh, much of an appetite for doing repairs to the building um, following an earthquake or who isn't willing to accommodate that because of production in the building or because of the value of the property, uh, you might need to design for a larger mean recurrence interval when you're looking at these uh, performance-based uh, drifts for the facade. So as a quick example of that, uh, this is a project example you might lay out as a guide for a discussion with the owner. Certainly, you're going to have collapse prevention of the building, uh, and uh, you're going to design for the maximum of considered earthquake, and you're not probably going to bother calculating the drift in this case, because all we're really trying to do is make sure the building doesn't collapse. We definitely need to design for two-thirds of the maximum considered earthquake to meet code. That's required by ASCE 716. And uh, if you have a building that is in risk category one or two that's a low rise, uh, you might be designing for a uh, for a interstory height divided by 40, or two and a half percent drift between adjacent floors. That's likely to cause some fairly significant damage to relatively brittle facade systems, but curtain wall systems may be able to accommodate that much drift with relatively minor damage to sealants. Uh, you may want to design a discussion with the owner for a shorter retur mean return period. Uh, given the life of the building, let's say it's 50 years, that has a 39% chance of occurring in that 50-year span. And that would give you a significantly smaller lateral drift that you have to design for. So that's an example of how you might have this discussion with an owner. <clears throat> 
So uh, concluding here, we would look at different levels of probability of occurrence, so a 10% probability of occurrence in a 50-year event. This is effectively a code-level earthquake. You make sure the code provisions are met. In terms of envelope performance for air and water barriers, um, it's going to be assumed that if you've had this level of vent, you're probably going to be replacing the barriers and the cladding as part of uh, rehabilitating the building if, in fact, you don't tear it down outright. If you're looking for a, a 20% probability of occurrence in a 50-year span, you're looking at a 225-year mean recurrence interval. So you might expect some modest repairs, some aesthetic repairs to the building, uh, but the building should be able to be reused. And if you're looking at something that's a 50% probability of occurrence in 50 years, it's a much shorter uh, re mean recurrence interval, and you should expect little or no repair in that case. And the, the connections and the building frame remain elastic, and there's no visible damage to cladding, and the air and water barriers remain uh, serviceable after the event. So that's all I have for you today. I'm going to turn it back to Nate, and I believe he's going to open the floor for some questions. All right. Thank you, Alec. We will get to some questions from the audience here in a moment. But first, we, as we've done the first couple of live sessions of this webinar series, are going to have a couple of poll questions for the audience. So we'll go ahead and move forward to those. And here's the first question. It's a true or false statement. And the audience can pick on their computer screens which they think is the, the correct answer. So true or false, vertical movements only affect horizontal joints, and horizontal movements only affect vertical joints. That statement, true or false? Vertical movements only affect horizontal joints, and horizontal movements only affect vertical joints. All right, looks like most of the answers are in. We're going to go ahead and close the poll. And Alec, it looks like it's near unanimous uh, decision from the audience that this is a false statement. Did they get that one right? They did. That is the correct response. The answer is false. So as we talked about early on in the presentation, uh, vert vertical joints can undergo compression or expansion to, as the spandrel beam uh, for supporting the facade moves up and down. And uh, horizontal joints are also affected by vertical movements. So the answer to this is false. All right. Let's see if the next one poses a, a bigger challenge. So this question is a multiple choice. For a light gauge framed backup wall that allows lateral drift via rigid body translation, the backup wall top connection typically does not restrain A, vertical movement, B, out of plane horizontal movement, C, in plane horizontal movement, D, all of the above, E, A, and B, or is it F? A and C. For a light gauge framed backup wall that allows lateral drift via rigid body rotation, or translation, sorry, the backup wall top connection typically does not restrain vertical movement, out of plane horizontal movement, in plane horizontal movement, or some combination of those three. Give the audience a little bit more time to think this one through. All right, it looks like most of the responses are in, and we'll go ahead and close the poll. All right, Alec, it looks like about two-thirds of the participants thought that the answer was F, both answers A and C, and then 
the other third is sort of distributed across all the other options. So what was the correct answer to this one? The answer that we were going for here, Nate, was answer F, A, and C. And at the top of a, a, a uh, light gauge metal frame backup wall, we want to make sure that it is not loaded by the structural movement above. So A is correct in this case, uh, but that's only part of the answer. The top of wall connection needs to restrain out of plane movement so that the wall doesn't fall away from the building or push into the building. So it's not B. And then C, in plane movement, we don't want to restrict that either. We want to make sure that the uh, floor above this wall is able to displace parallel to the plane of the wall laterally. So C is also correct. So the correct answer to the question overall is F, A and C. Right. Well, good job, everyone. So we'll go ahead and move to some of the questions that have come in over the course of this presentation. And for our first question, we'll go back to slide 13. And this subject of transitional building. So in this detail, uh, one of the question or one of the participants is asking is for buildings like this, is there issues with water getting through the masonry and affecting the steel beam that is shown in this detail? Is that something you've had any experience seeing? Yes, indeed it is. Um, buildings like this are very susceptible to corrosion of the steel frame behind the masonry. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, this type of facade system essentially relies on the thickness of the masonry to prevent water ingress into the building. And brick, in particular, will absorb moisture over time and release it slowly. So it absorbs moisture from rain and, uh, and holds on to it kind of like a sponge. So it can hold the moisture in intimate contact with the steel over time. Uh, and that moisture will promote corrosion of the steel frame. And you can have some fairly significant loss of masonry as the rust products on the steel beam or the embedded items that are embedded in the masonry. As those corrode, the corrosion product expands about eight to ten times the original volume of the metal that it replaced. And that expansive force can, uh, can dislodge the masonry from the building. So in buildings like this uh, that were constructed from, let's say, the 1890s through perhaps 1940s or maybe early 50s, uh, it's not uncommon to see a lot of deterioration of the spandrel beams and the perimeter columns that are encased in masonry like this. All right. Question, we'll move to slide 32. And this question is about the rigid body translation option that you show here. And the question is simply, how is a hinge introduced um, when you're using this type of rigid body translation? So it's, it's introduced through the um, connection of the window frame to the, <clears throat> to the, the, the cladding panel, or perhaps there's a backup behind it. But that, it's probably shown here a bit more um, dramatically than, it, in fact, it would be in real in real practice. This is, I think the graphic exaggerates the amount of rotation that would be likely to occur. Uh, but regardless, that has to be accommodated in the connection of the sill and window head. And how the how the designer chooses to do do that is probably up to them. It probably wouldn't be di dictated by the architect. All right, well, uh, there's a, also a question on the rigid body rotation option here that you're showing. Uh, and the question is, how, do the, how does the upper connection allow for rotation with two, po two points of connection? So in, in the upper detail, we're showing a plate coming off of the bottom flange of the spandrel beam. Um, in, uh, in reality, that might be done with <clears throat> something a bit more flexible on the vertical leg. Um, it may just be done with a, a rod or something like that that connects the precast panel and allows some flexibility uh, so that the panel is able to rotate 
um, between the uh, upper and lower connections of the spandrel beam. All right. Um, and I, I think it's possible the question asker may be thinking that uh, both off the top of the slab and the and the bottom of the of the beam is supporting the same wall. But uh, just to be clear, is there a joint actually between those two connections at the top floor level? Uh, yes, there there would be. I think it's shown very lightly here in gray, but there is a joint between the two, unless it's a two-story panel. But I, I think the intent here is that there is a, a, uh, a joint between the two right there. All right. Moving to slide 40. Um, rigid body translation connection. So the question is, is how are the details handled for air and water barrier for the rigid body translation approach? So I think it depends on what the backup system behind the cladding is. Um, if you have something that is um, that is not a panelized facade system, in other words, it's not assembled in a fabricator shop and brought to the site, uh, there it's possible to have a uh, uh, some some fairly wide joints between the two on the back on the backup wall, which is really the, where the primary waterproofing is, and that we typically provide a silicone sheet between the two portions of the backup um, that is the primary waterproofing. So that silicone sheet is able to uh, stretch a good bit parallel to the plane of the joint. Um, in cases where you have a, a pre-manufactured facade system, such as precast, um, trying to uh, protect this joint from damage during a uh, lateral event, whether that's earthquake or uh, wind, is a good bit more tricky. And you probably have to limit the amount of deflection to whatever the joint material can accommodate parallel to the joint. Um, usually, precast wall systems are reliant on the sealant joints, even if they have a, 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 a primary inner seal and an outer exterior seal. They are reliant on sealant joints for their air and water tightness. So you may need to limit the amount of uh, interstory drift of the building frame to protect the joints. Okay. Question will go to slide 64 now. This question was asked at this point in the presentation. Uh, but the question is a little bit of a general question. The question is, how often are drift issues associated with high se seismic zones only or high wind zones only? Uh, I guess he's asking from your experience, how, how often do you see these issues? And in more traditional gravity-dominated regions, are, the issue, are these types of issues as common? Well, I think the, the short answer is that, uh, for example, on the East Coast, where we might be concerned more about wind than seismic, um, perhaps these, these kinds of details are less uh, focused on in the design of the cladding system. Um, certainly in the West Coast, these are, are very uh, important issues to keep in mind, uh, where you have fairly large inelastic drifts that you need to be able to accommodate. On the East Coast, perhaps the drifts are less, uh, where we, are, we have um, lower magnitude events. But regardless, I think, regardless of where the building is, you need to focus on the fact that you could potentially have damage at a corner joint uh, where one facade attempts to move perpendicular to the other facade, and that could potentially damage the uh, air and water barriers that are behind uh, what you see on the outside of the building. And in order to do that, we need to put some real thought into what these corner joints look like. So I guess I would advocate that we should be perhaps putting more thought into joints like these, um, even on uh, the uh, more wind and gravity dominated portions of the country. All right. 
on slide 72, you mentioned a few uh, MRI years here. And the question is simply, which MRI should be used for serviceability? That's a good question. And it really depends upon uh, the, the owner's uh, tolerance for being willing to make repairs to the building following the, uh, the event that you end up designing for. So for example, if you have a hospital building, um, with we're having the the building being uh, unoccupied or having leakage in it that could potentially cause a health problem to the building's occupants, uh, perhaps you should be designing for the 100-year mean recurrence interval. Um, but if you have a building that's relatively low risk, <clears throat> like a warehouse building, relatively few occupants, it's unlikely to damage the contents of the building if you do get leakage at joints, um, maybe designing for a 25-year mean recurrence interval is appropriate. And doing that might save you some uh, cost in terms of the tonnage of the steel of the building frame. So it's the discussions I think that we as building designers should have with uh, the building owners and the building occupants to determine what level of, of uh, design that they, they want to have in their building. All right, and there was an, sort of a related question. Um, you, a couple of slides prior to this, you show the H over, the kind of traditional H over 400 uh, drift limit. And the question is, um, what recurrence interval do you typically associate with the H over 400 uh, drift limit? Uh, again, I think that's the that's the uh, the other uh, related question to the side we were just talking about. Um, for building drift, we would typically design for something less than the strength design um, loads that we would get for the uh, say 1700 year mean recurrence interval. So we would typically design for H over 400 for one of these mean recurrence intervals that's here on the screen, whether that's 100 years or 50 years or 25 years, we would design for a, a reduced wind speed and therefore reduced wind pressure when we're evaluating the traditional H over 400 or H over 450 drift limit. Right, well, thank you very much, Alec. Uh, we, ha we do have a, a number of other questions, uh, but we are um, just past the, the top of the hour here. So um, for anybody who asked a question that we weren't able to get to during this live question and answer session, we'll work with Alec um, in the coming week to uh, see about responding to those folks via email. So thanks, thanks everyone for, for their interest in the and some of these questions that they've asked.